Good morning, Bob. Good morning. How you doing, Charles? It's Friday. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! <laughs> we made it. We made it. Yes. It's Friday. You know, I, say, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you very much for enlightening me these last few weeks that I've been privileged to join your group. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Yeah. It's, it's been a pleasure and an honor to uh, enlighten you, I guess, <laughs> for whatever for whatever that's worth. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's like today, um, it's kind of an exciting day. It's, it's like, okay, this is the, it's sad because today's the last, last classes that we'll be able to see each other until November, but, you know, I'm getting ready to go on a, <laughs> what, what could turn out to be an, an enormous adventure here. Oh, it's always okay. exciting. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of revved up. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And in fact, I'm- We are to... happy for you. Pardon? We are happy for you, You're whatever happy... you will find good for you. Well, thank yes, you. Yes, have a great trip. Yeah, I will. Um, in fact, I've got a trip to share with you that I took yesterday, okay? You know, because as, as often I do on my Tuesdays and Thursdays when I don't have a long list of things I've got to do, uh, I go on an adventure. And uh, boy, did I go on an adventure yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I had never been to a place uh, in the state of Georgia called Waycross, Georgia. Has anybody ever been there? No. Yes, many times. Yes. Okay. What do you, <laughs> what do you think of Waycross, Eloise? It's a tiny, it's a little town. My husband's family is from that area. So. Mm -hmm. It's a big swamp. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. It is. It's called the Okefenokee Swamp. Right. Oh, right. wow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and guess what? There's a, there's a house there that I went to go see yesterday. And uh, it's, it's, it's a two-bedroom, one-bath house, but it's got a, I want to say it's a 4,600-square-foot garage. Awesome. Oh. Wow behind it the the older couple who owned it owned an an rv about the size of the queen mary and uh and they needed to park it somewhere <laughs> so the guy built a this huge garage and he put a whole apartment you know out there you know for guests and things so it's literally it's got a kitchen it's got a bathroom it's got a bedroom it's got a laundry room sort of, and this is just the apartment okay out in this 4600 square foot building uh it's crazy yeah and i can afford it well wow. okay. oh, that's even better <laughs> yeah and i you know um and like i said i went on this little adventure yesterday and uh you know when the guy told me uh that it would take me about four hours hey richard how you doing you got your hand up I just want to say, White Cross should need to be prepared for mosquitoes, alligators, and rattlesnakes. Okay. All right. And okay. lots of heat. <laughs> yeah, lots of heat. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, but uh, you know, while I was out there, I went by uh, about a mile and a half from this house is a place called the Heritage Center. And, uh, and, and it's also where the, what is it, South, Southeast Forest something, you know, they're all there together. And uh, at the Heritage Center, they have a neglected wood shop and a neglected art studio and pottery studio. And, uh, you know, they, they would be happy to see me come there because I know how to do all those things. Yes, you, know? you do. And so, uh, so, you know, I'm giving that some thought, you know? <laughs> interesting thought. Huh? That's interesting. Yeah, it is. Okay. And, and, you know, after I went to Waycross yesterday and I checked out, there's only one art store in Waycross and that's uh, Hobby Lobby. 
and, and I went and uh, bought some watercolor canvases and, and a little bit of watercolor so I'd have something to play with while I was there. Uh, but I drove over after, you know, looking around Waycross, which actually is kind of charming. It's kind of a charming little town. Um, you know, and regionally, they've got a few things going on in the arts there. Um, you know, there is a, uh, a regional uh, arts, uh, what are they? Anyway, it's, it's a regional art, arts organization uh, for uh, Southern Georgia. And so they've kind of connected like Valdosta, you know, Brunswick, Savannah, uh, Waycross, Dublin, you know, all those towns together. And, uh, and, you know, they've got a few things going on, a few projects. In fact, the downtown area of Waycross, they've got a renovation project, um, you know, that they've got a fair amount of money that they're trying to bring back to downtown. And uh, there might be a possibility of doing a few murals and things down there on some of those old uh, office buildings. So. Did you see any houses? I did, yeah. I saw one house and I really liked it, you know. Um, that's the one I was talking about. And it's, uh, it's an old house. The original house, they don't know when it was built. Um, you know, it looks like it was probably built, you know, maybe like right before 1900. Uh, it's a craftsman or was a craftsman kind of house. And uh, they've updated it a lot. You can't really recognize it as a craftsman anymore. Uh, but, uh, okay, you know, I can live with that. You know, my, my sad thing is it doesn't have a fireplace. If it, if it, if it did have a fireplace, they had taken it out long ago. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it kind of looks like an old house on the outside, but inside it's, it's a pretty open, light, airy, very kind of modern house with kind of an old floor plan on it. And it's, it's nice. I like it, you know. You, you could always add an electric fireplace. I, I hate electric fireplaces. <laughs> Boo, <laughs> thumb, thumbs down. No way. <laughs> yeah, not, no, no, no. I, I'll put I'll put a real fireplace in there, you know. Sure. That's not a problem, you know. Yeah, that's that's not difficult to do. Hmm. Well, Charles, it sounds like you're already there. No, I'm not. I have to drive to Missouri first. Oh, okay. The show me state. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a house way out there in the middle of uh, it's it uh, it sits on the edge of a mountain that goes. Uh, it's about probably 200 yards down to the Black River. Wow. And, and it's a solid stone house that needs a little uh -huh. love. Yeah. But, uh, and it's, it's a craftsman. It's got all, all the built-in craftsman stuff. It's got the fireplace. Everything else is there. It just needs to be cleaned up and, you know, a little bit of love. Mm -hmm. and, and they're ask, asking almost nothing for it. Wow. Like, yeah. I'm I'm talking less than twenty thousand dollars. Oh wow, that's so, incredible. Yeah, that that, that yeah. might be a little scary though. <laughs> Why might it be scary? Well, there may be some underlying things that you that that uh, it's hard to detect in, in houses like that. So uh -huh. yeah, oh, you, you mean foundation. you mean structurally and foundation wise? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, actually, I already I already know the answer to that which is no, there's oh, no. Good. So it's got good bones. Yeah, I've already had somebody look at it and uh, I, I paid them um, what, I paid them about $250 to go out and do an inspection on it. And, and the, the big downfall with that house is there's no cell phone service out there. Oh. But, but you can get a landline and you can get hardwired uh, internet. So I can still do Zoom classes. Um, <laughs> what yeah. airport? What airport would you fly into? St. Louis. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and from that airport, how far is it to that house? Uh, three and a half hours. Wow. You, okay. Not too bad. So mm -hmm. the Black River runs through several states there. Uh. Yeah, 
I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah, but it's, I mean, literally, I mean, this, you, you can walk down the hill and, and go trout fishing. Oh my goodness. So yeah, it's, it sounds hard. It does, you know, a tiny little town, but you know, and I'd have to go to St. Louis or, uh, you know, one of like, I, I could go, I could go to Little Rock. Little Rock is just as far away from, um, or Memphis, you know, Memphis and Little Rock are just as far away as St. Louis. You know, it's about a three hour drive in either direction. So, oh, okay. Yeah. So I've got a few metropolitan areas I could choose, you know, yeah. to have it, you know, if I need to be around people. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> but I, could, I could just let my hair and my beard grow way, way down. <laughs> Charles, you, you know, are, Charles, you are a people person. Don't kid yourself. Oh, I, I like people. No, I, I, no, I love people actually. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, but getting back to uh, my little adventure yesterday, uh, I, I ended up in Dublin or not Dublin, uh, Brunswick. Yeah. And, um, that's a really fascinating little town. Uh, it's actually got about eight art galleries there. And, um, and they, they seem to have a real active uh, community a as well. And so there's a lot of stuff going on uh, in the arts in that area. And if you guys ever adventure, you know, out into the world and you want to go explore that area, it would be a good place to go to. Um, Is Brunswick military? No. <laughs> Explore those islands down there. They're beautiful. I'm sorry, what? You can explore the islands down there. They're beautiful. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, just driving over to Brunswick um, was. I mean, there were so many beautiful places that you could have stopped. You know, in the salt marshes and stuff, and painted. I and um, you know the uh, challenge that we did with that. Uh, it was. It was. It was a snowy egret. There you go. That's the kind of bird that was out there. Guess oh. what? I saw trees that were absolutely full with snowy egrets. I mean, we're talking 30 or 40 of them in one tree, you know? They were having a congregation. Yes. Yeah, out there in the salt marshes. And it, it was beautiful out there. I yeah. bet. So, and, you know, and I like boats and, um, you know, they had a beautiful boat dock out there, you know, with literally thousands of boats, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's, it's a nice little town. It, it really is. So, so yeah, I'm kind of thinking, you know, well, let's see. Do I want to head toward the water? Because I like water. Uh, or do I want to be on a river? And so. We'll Charles, can I give you one bit of advice? Yeah. Um, my parents, who are both past now, mm -hmm. lived in Tallahassee, but had a place on the Gulf Coast that was like 50 miles south, and their dream was to retire there. When they retired there, it was wonderful for about three or four years, and then their health deteriorated to the point where they were back and forth between their house and Tallahassee mm -hmm. for doctor's appointments and going to the hospital. And so consider who has the best medical facilities close by too. Wherever yeah, that, that was one of my five things on the list to, to think about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and the, the place in Missouri, that's one of the big drawbacks, you know? Oh. Yeah. I mean, where are you going to go? Yeah. 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 You know, you're three and a half hours away from someplace. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and you're 20 miles outside, the first sign of any kind of civilization whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, on a on a fairly small mountain road. <laughs> so, so yeah, that that one's a little iffy, but I still love the idea of that house anyway. Um, but um, so I'm going to share with you guys a. Uh, I want to introduce you to a guy, and I mentioned him a few times. Uh, his name is David LaFell, okay? 
and it's L-A-F-E, I think E-E-L, or maybe just E-L. Uh, anyway, David, he's a New Yorker. He mutters a lot, okay? Uh, he mutters a lot? He mutters a lot. No mutters. Yeah, yeah. He's, he, he, you know, he'll, he'll be painting along, and he'll be talking, and he just kind of goes, you know? And uh, so, so sometimes he's a little hard to kind of make out, you know, what, what he's actually saying. Uh, but don't let that deter you because uh, it's well worth uh, watching, you know, uh, you know, him. Anyway, he's going to, I've got a demo. Uh, it runs about an hour. In fact, it runs a little over. Okay. Right. And, uh, you know, just uh, kind of watch through. This is done through, uh, what is it? Uh, Oh, yeah, streamline art videos, okay? And if you're not familiar with them, uh, you need to be. Uh, they have a whole series of artists, uh, play, primarily a la prima and plain air painters. Um, and you, you can get a wealth of information. And they just went through a period, starting back in March, where uh, they had all these videotapes of these demos uh, of various artists, and they're actually put them out there for free for people to watch. Wow. So, you know, yeah, and I mean, you know, like LaFell's video that you're gonna watch this morning, uh, I, think, I think it's about 140 or $150 if you wanna buy it. Wow, that's a little steep. Um, but, you know, through Streamline, um, and they, they're the same publishing company, by the way, that does Plain Air Magazine and Art Connoisseur. So, uh, you know, it, it, they're a good resource and well worth taking a look at. Anyway, I'm going to play this, uh, this, and then we'll get back and we'll, you know, continue talking about other things. Okay. That's one. Publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, okay. Realism Today, Everybody Plain see Air that? Today, and American Water Company, yep. and events, the Plain Air Convention, and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials in ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video air has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offering. Can you see everything we do? Or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. So what exactly is this global virtual painting event called Plein Air Live? Yep, they're gonna advertise to you. See if we can skip some of this. Back up a little bit. David LaFell. It's called <coughs> the Art of Painting. Enjoy. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, since you know the first demonstration I did, uh, I we did a, a still life going across the canvas, you know, left to right. I thought I'd set up something that had more of a movement of front to back. Uh, just just to give you that kind of a, an idea. Thank 
so in any case, what I try to do is set up something in a sense that starts here with this bunch of grapes and then up to the, the turnip and then the bars back here with the flowers to have that kind of a semicircle uh, semicircle movement. And starting out you know, just with drawing the idea of the painting so that instead of really drawing anything specifically in terms of the object, but really drawing the idea of- Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate that. And then putting the objects on top, putting the objects on top of the idea. Similar to having a idea for a book that you have the entire theme of the book and you use your characters and plots, subplots to, to illustrate the theme and how many characters and subplots you put into the main theme becomes the pace of how fast or slow you get from page one to page two so that the same thing in painting that how many characters in terms of colors, values, textural changes becomes the pace of the entire painting. The more uh, things that the painter gives you to look at, the slower the pace of the painting. So that everything you put in your painting has a, a significance to it that everything or should have a significance rather than being haphazard right? because it'll be read a particular way just like a, a, a novel or an essay is read then your painting is read by how many brush brush strokes the kind of brush strokes you use how many changes. So everything you give the viewer to look at will cause them to stop or go at a certain rate of speed from one place on the canvas to the next place. So when you're setting up, when you're setting up a still life, that's some of what you're considering as you're placing objects uh, down is to really uh, do it for the pace of the picture, whether you're, you know, whether you're aware or not, you're setting it up. Of course, the more you're aware of anything, the more you can control it. So that it, it sort of behooves each painter to understand the whole setup and rather than just using objects and moving them around, but to have some grasp of the whys and wherefore of picture making. So learning to paint is not only about painting things, but, but seeing getting a sense of the whole painting and becoming sensitive to the whole painting. And the significance of what to put in and what to leave out. If you did this, I'm trying to get this to come around and using the different objects to bring your eye to a particular place in the painting like stringing beads, the painting has kind of a string beads to it and I'm putting the objects just as you would be putting the objects on those beads to form a pathway to get from 
one place to the other. So everything will be on this kind of the movement. Then just getting a sense of the object as in terms of shapes, more abstract, thinking about it more abstractly. Go from here, okay, then the change of face here and then so forth. And ultimately flowers. So that's that would be the main pathway. But, and you see how just drawing that right away creates the sense of movement. The other part of painting, the most important part in terms of learning is learning to use your brush in a particular way, learning to hold the brush properly so that you could make arm movements rather than finger movements. And so that you have a sense of painting and making brush strokes rather than drawing. So to be relaxed and just have the control uh, so that you're thinking brush strokes. You're always thinking brush strokes rather than drawing. Uh, it's very important to find out the difference between drawing and painting so that no matter what you do with your brush, you're thinking painting, painting strokes. You, you, the brush has a certain width, dimension, and you're using it to apply paint manipulate paint on the surface. You have to think in terms of masses and planes rather than line and tone. So to, to learn to paint, it's a matter of cultivating, thinking like a painter. So that you have to see the line, uh, have to see mass, shape, values, rather than Going line and painting, painting tone. If you think drawing, then you can learn how to paint. <coughs> so part of it is finding out the difference. So holding the brush, you know, keeping your arm relaxed, making paint stroke, regardless of you know, painting round grades. But you're still making brush strokes, not thinking I have to go around, around. I mean, at some time that might be appropriate, but it's how to make shapes, simple shapes, and then make those shapes into something more complex or more particular, starting from general and from general and then and making going in general. So that the, the only technique one has to really learn in painting is the technique of holding the brush properly and making paint strokes from the shoulder, very relaxed, so that everything just Feeling the pain and just the delight in the pain and not thinking through it, but this is a whole shadow play, whatever it is. So it's getting that into the nervous system, um, so making the whole play. And you think of the shadow when you're doing the shadow as a wall that the light can't get past the shadow. You're doing shadow, but you're all, you're doing it as a, like a wall. 
the light can't get there, can't get past the shadows. So it's like rigid support to support the light. But whatever this shadow is, this shadow is. It's so much light, so much. There's a, a logic to everything that, there's a logic to everything you do that unifies the picture. So part of it is seeing, uh, seeing the unity. So that each time you paint, you don't have to relearn, you don't have to relearn the pain, how to do it. That you paint one thing, you can paint anything. Part of it is deciphering what makes each thing look like it does. Each time you go over something, do it with the same consideration that you did it the first time. So using those values of dark and Since everything, we want everything to lead to the back, the idea is to keep everything in the foreground here. Relatively dark. Create more of a shadow. So the light works further back in the painting. Now, there are two things to consider in learning how to paint. Um, one is how do, how do you get to paint the objects that you're painting to look at, the, how to get the objects you're painting to look like the objects that are in front of you, which is, I think, what most people start out thinking when they think about learning to paint. And the other is learning to paint by getting a sense of the odd, uh, getting a sense of the paint quality of your brush, the paint quality on your brush, so that you learn to manipulate paint so that if you learn to just get a feeling of the paint and what it feels like what it looks like you will then you'll be able to paint anything in terms of the object that you want to paint, but you'll be able to control control the paint. What's happening at the end of your brush? So, generally, my advice would be to focus. on 
on the pain first and almost secondarily focus on trying to make something look like what it looks like, or maybe I should say more important than not to neglect one over the other, so that when you're trying to learn how to paint, you're thinking and feeling the paint on your brush. A good working procedure is you know, starting with your car to set a value for your back window. And then saving your lights to last. It stops give you the structure of the painting and keep the composition in place. So you set your, try to set your darkest dark in the foreground and then use the back to find the back of the bag. And then as it hits, save your light for land. So the light is the foreground and the shadows, your darks, regardless of where they are in the picture frame, and your darks or what you decide is background could be the hair on a person, uh, you know, hair, garment, so really not thinking in terms of foreground and background, uh, in terms of picture playing, but foreground and background in terms of aesthetics. So that uh, when you, after you've set up something or while you're setting up a still life or a model, you are thinking what you want to have be seen in the picture and what is background that you don't want to be seen. Uh, so that the more things you know or can determine as you're setting up a, a still life or a figurative painting or even looking at a landscape, the more things you can know about how you want the picture to come out, the better it, it'll come out. Um, the more you're just winging it, then you're in a very difficult, very difficult position because if you don't know where you're going, you usually wind up someplace else. <laughs> True. Or you know where you're going. Uh, the more comfortable, the better the painting. I'm putting putting light on, just getting a nice background. One thing that the more paint you have on your surface, the easier it is to paint just getting stuff down in the beginning just to have something to work into. So the more paint you use, or the, the easier real it is to paint. The less paint you have on your surface or a dry surface, in a sense, you have to work much harder to manip manipulate the paint. It's much easier to work into much easier to work into paint, a, a nice paint surface.
Well, here. Well, essentially for the reason that, uh, and, and actually I should also say that I don't always do, you know, an absolute flat background. But the reason to do backgrounds a particular way depends on what takes place, what you have taken place in the foreground. I mean, in a sense, you can see this background still and may wind up, you know, with a lot of texture in it, but the background by definition should be, should be background. So that busier you make it, the less it really is in fact background. Um, it becomes foreground. And I think one of the reasons that students, uh, actually, students we're, we're in a sense all students, uh, but one of the reasons that people make the background, do a lot of stuff in the background, is because the foreground isn't compelling enough in the finished painting so that. Once you've done the foreground, you feel unsatisfied with the result of the painting, then there's nothing much left to do except to go into the background and do more work in the background. <laughs> and what happens is that you lose background, that the background becomes part of the foreground because it's too busy. So, painting is, a, you can also explain that painting is a series of relationships. And we have the relationship of thick paint and thin paint. We have a relationship of hard edges and soft edges. Color against colorlessness. So the same would hold true for foreground and background. If everything is foreground, then nothing is foreground. Mm. Something to establish a relation, what's foreground, what's background, both aesthetically and in terms of the picture picture planes. So by definition, a background is something you don't in the painting. If you look at it, it's foreground. So the most important thing is to determine, as I said earlier, what you want the person to see and what you don't want them to see in your mind so that you have a sense of the foreground and background of, of your painting. That, so you know the, the whys and wherefores, why you're picking certain objects, and what you're going to do put into the picture what you don't want to be seeing, what you want to do. You know, it's again, just like a magician, uh, you're, you're conducting, you're conducting the painting and getting the people to look, look don't look bad. Kind of, uh, and I, You know, just the, the same in music, you have the passive, soft passages, and loud passages, uh, different, the different coloration of the instrument. So the same language 
and principles hold true, hold true in painting. You mean in the beginning of the painting? Sorry, the top. I use it with two colors. I'm starting to paint. Usually you know, an umber and a blue in the red. So burnt umber and yellow blue. Or, uh, ultramarine blue, but uh, usually a blue and an umber to, to start out. And it just gives you uh, a chance to, uh, without drawing, to get a feeling of the, you know, the coloration of what you're doing. Everything I do with, and you can do is to change, change your brush pressure so you get thicker uh, passages as, as you're going along to change color. So, you know, you can get a sense of, a sense of the different shapes and how they relate to, to one another. So, you know, improve. so you don't just, you know, not to get lost in With the grapes you have, the highlight and the transparent light, and you get a sense of the grapes look very much like paint pool, where they basically have an overall value rather than a pattern of light and shadow. And here you could almost do what I you could call a wet in wet glaze where the white red and you could just close blue into it. Some of the that's the bluish blood into the white to get some of the markings of the of the gray. But trying to keep the value very close, very close. And it was even reflected light, and then there's also the richness of the light coming through it. With that great light quality. A great brush stroke. And that's try to always try to over whatever you do, do it when you're making a brush stroke. No matter how big or small you are not trying to draw, but you're trying to move paint from one place to another and deposit. Deposit the paint in the sink. Try to, you know, if nothing else, if nothing else, try to control paint and think in terms of brush work. You know, picking up paint and So big or small, you're making a very firm, very definite mark, a very definite mark with your brush. But, uh, delicate, but trying to control. So that you're always making, theoretically, always making like, Nice brush. 
No. No, I don't. Only when I'm trying to do water today. Which I do every so often. Hurt myself. I still can't do watercolor. It just it's really hard for me to do watercolor. I don't think I don't think like a watercolor is so that <laughs> watercolor. Still trying to get the paint to be thicker, which of course is not really what you want to do when you do watercolor. So uh, I don't do enough to change my way of thinking, uh, enough to really get into a watercolor type mindset to watercolor, so they always come out. I, you know, they always come out not looking at watercolor. I don't know enough about the medium of I haven't taken enough time. Uh, similar when I was, uh, for a short period of time, I tried test. And it, it's really learning to what the media will do. So the same if you want to become a water, if I would really feel like becoming a watercolorist, then the thing you have to do, the same as with oil, you have to practice paint enough so you get a feeling of how much water to paint. Uh, you know, it's not so much, you know, if you can think in those times and uh, apply it to painting in oil, that, that I said earlier, in terms of learning to paint with oil, you want to learn what the brush will do, how much uh, paint you have on the brush, your surface, getting a feeling of that kind of thing. That, that, so you'd be learning how to paint, so if you could understand that it's the same analogy in terms of learning, me learning watercolor or anybody, is you have to learn the, the, the actual paint itself how much water to put me, the kind of paper, the absorbency of the paper, how the different pigments work. So it, it's the same thing. So for you or anyone to learn to paint in oil, you want to learn like how, what kind of, what you can do with the brush. And what the brush will do for you, what the paint will do for you. you understand? Maybe that. If you could think like that, get that idea that help you learn to paint in terms of seeing. <laughs> Painting is like just making something look like, look like something. You don't know how you could cover something. Does that make it clearer? So if you wanted to learn pastel, you'd have to learn it. Uh, how about paper, kinds of paper, how absorbent the paper is, things of that nature to learn to, to do pastel. You have to get a material in other words. To learn anything and in painting, you have to get a sense of the material. Essentially, the, the, it gives you, but it, it would be true of any medium that you say it could be, you know, sand oil and turpentine liquid. Any medium would be, the reason to use it would be that it allows you to manipulate it that in a very comfortable, in a very comfortable fashion. So good. Before I used Marage, I used to paint with copal uh, painting when it was real copal. 
um, now it's plastic. It's called copalumina, but it's really some kind of plastic polymer medium. Uh, and I, 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 I liked it, the uh, copal painting medium. While I was using copal, I was, I was making marriage and bringing it over to the art students league and selling it to the students as a way of making money. And I don't know why I would I refuse to uh, actually use the match I was making, kind of a stubborn, stubborn, stubborn street or rebellion. Anyhow, what happened was one day I was doing a painting and I ran out of copal. In the mid middle of the painting, I didn't feel like running down to the art supply store and interrupting myself, so I just took some of my the marriage that I on order, you know, for school, and I just started using, I started using the marriage and I liked it, I liked the way it worked. Uh, it allowed me to do, you know, to manipulate the paint very comfortably, you know, thick, Thin, thin paint with strong properties. So I was kind of stuck, hooked on, hooked on the manager. But any medium you use, you're really doing it so that you can paint very comfortably. You know, that your handwriting, you can overpaint, paint as long as you want. Uh, that's really the reason for using any medium. And since uh, Marge basically does that, there's no reason for me not to, not to use it. Intermission. Intermission. <laughs> okay. okay, there you go. Charles, I have some questions. Yeah, okay. What is that chisel type tool called he used to spread a lot of paint on the board? You know, palette knife? Palette knife, thank you. <laughs> Okay, here's my other questions. Is this a quiz yeah. or questions? Okay. Well, uh, why does he brace his hand with the other paint brushes and are those the group of brushes that he's using on the entire thing? Yeah, he'll, yeah, when he's going back and forth, you know, a lot of times he'll have a couple of brushes in his hand and so right. he'll just switch them out to the brush he wants. Uh, okay, so, so he doesn't actually he doesn't actually clean each of those brushes. He just uses the paint for that particular hue or shade, and then he comes back to that when he needs it later. No, 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 no. Okay. It, it's not about mixing color. It's about the shape of the brush and and what the brush will do as far as laying in a paint. Okay. You know, okay. is is okay. he something that's um, you know has has you know, you can actually see the paint strokes in, or is it something softer that he's going to blend an edge, you know, or blend into another color? Um, you know, so he'll go back and forth between something that's like a real stiff, hard bristle brush to something that's maybe like a synthetic brush or something that's a little bit softer. That can okay. okay. Does he clean his brush between changing colors? Uh, no, not so much. You know, he'll he'll just at all. he'll take a, a a rag and he'll wipe the you know paint out. Right. You know, and then he'll pick up more color from there. But yeah, he doesn't really clean them with solvent or anything like that because he doesn't want to, you know, introduce the solvent into the actual paint because what solvent does is it breaks down the bond of the paint. Right. He doesn't want to do that. Uh, okay. And I think he uses that left hand as something like a, a mall stick with the brushes, the, the folding the brushes. Yeah. Which yeah. Paints. Yeah, you can. You know, you can use those brushes, you know, as a guide as well. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the medium that he's using. It's called uh, Merage. Uh, yes. And it, it, so it's, it's kind of like heavy gel medium for acrylic. It's just a very... You know, it's like uh, it's like a very very thick mixture. Um, you know, like 
you can get Liquin and there's all kinds of different brands. Uh, mm -hmm. But what that does is rather than using a solvent to thin the paint or to mix with the paint, using that and it keeps the body of the paint pretty consistent to what it was when it came out of the tube, right? Okay. It just, um, you know, with some paints, like particularly in the lighter colors, uh, like certain whites, uh, like Naples yellow, if you get real Naples yellow, it can be kind of stiff. And so you're mixing it with this medium and that makes it, you know, flow a little bit better and, and be able to kind of actually move around. So that's what he's doing with that. Okay. Very good. Um, Anybody else? Okay. How does he duplicate the, uh, the um, values of a certain tone when he makes it? Does he, does he memorize it or does he has that much experience? He just knows how to duplicate the same color? Well, he's not always trying to duplicate the same exact color. If, oh. if, like when you looked at him painting either the pot or some of those grapes, right? He would go right. back and, you know, he would add a little blue or a little red or something to it. And, you know, because he's looking at a particular area of that surface and he's mixing a color and a value that he sees. So, uh, but what I see him doing is he's putting down a background uh, moss color and then that is what he's layering the final color over. Well, he started off with a mixture, in this case, of he used, it was probably like an ultramarine blue, or some kind of blue and a black, right. or a, uh, a, I'm sorry, a, 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 a burnt umber. And he's making a black, a very neutral, dark color, right? And, and really the first five minutes, all you saw him do was move the brush around and basically just sort of figure out where things were. Right. He wasn't really trying to draw them. He wasn't really trying to make uh, it look like any particular thing. It's just, okay, I'm gonna have a big shape up here. It's gonna be a pot. You know, there's gonna be a flower here. There's gonna be a right. here. And, and again, you know, he didn't sit and outline them and draw them, you know. Right. Uh, again, he's just trying to get the feel for how the painting is gonna flow and move. You know, so he's really addressing composition. At right. that. And then once he, he begins to get, you know, a pretty firm idea of how he wants to compose it, then he's actually, you know, getting into actually mixing various uh, values and colors, right? Before that, he didn't worry about that too much. You know, right. he wasn't really addressing, is this lighter or darker? And, you know, if he needed to do that, it's just a matter of how much pressure on the brush is he putting down, you know, and how much paint is he building up. If he wanted it darker, you know, more pressure, more direct paint strokes. If he just wanted kind of a, uh, an indication of it's a lighter value, he just went over that background and, you know, maybe just put like a very light tone. So okay, it's a little bit lighter, or a little bit darker in that area. Uh, you know, and that's before he ever started addressing the actual color mixing. Okay. I'm impressed. There's a lot to it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's good to watch. Now, he's hard to follow because, you know, he, he rambles a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's okay. You know. Anyway, uh, anybody else got any other questions? While we're... What, what kind of paint is he using? Uh, I think, I think he's using Gamelin, you know, I think, I think that's the, uh, the manufacturer. Uh, no, I'm, is it acrylic or oil? Oh, it's oil paint. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's an oil painter. Uh, oh. okay. Thank you. Uh, he, he kind of rambles enough to almost put you to sleep though. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, he's, he's not quite, he's not quite as bad as Dan Green. <laughs> you know, and Dan Green will kind of just, you know, it's a, it's kind of a, it's almost like a mantra or a chant. It's just this monotone, never changes, you know, kind of flow of, of noise with Dan. And, and Dan is actually, you know, if you have insomnia, you know, Dan is the cure for that. 
<laughs> you know, you, you can watch one of his videos, and I'll guarantee you, it doesn't last more than 15 minutes. Before Charles? you're totally. I, yeah. I just want to comment. I really like the distinction that he made between drawing and painting. And yeah. that, that was very good to understand. I, I appreciated that. Yeah, and that's, that's one of the reasons I know we're talking about drawing here. And, and that's one of the things uh, that I want you to get out of this video is the fact that so many of you, you know, it, it's like when you go into the process of painting, you, you're approaching it more like drawing, you know, right. you're trying to draw with color. And, and the thing I keep trying to emphasize to all of you is it's a whole totally different animal. It is. Um, you know, there is drawing and then there is painting and the two are not the same. And the mm -hmm. same. yeah. And, uh, and, and you can be a very good draftsman and a very poor painter, or you can be a great painter and not be able to draw your way out of a wet paper bag. So, uh, you know, the two don't, don't have to have the same thing. Anyway, we got about, uh, what, about 20 some odd minutes. Let's, let's okay. watch the last so. part of this. <coughs> Oh, yes, I, I remember. Yeah, uh, whether to yeah, finish something as you go along. You, you should finish the painting. Uh, my feeling is you should always do the finished painting. You know, the reason for doing you know, a, a highlight here or there uh, you know, is rather than waiting till the end of the painting or building up to the finish, it doesn't quite seem logical to me. I try to, everything I do, I try to do it as a finished brush stroke. Uh, the background notwithstanding. But my feeling is, my understanding is that the painting, the finished painting is, by definition, a series of intricate relationships that have all come together. And that if you don't have some part of all those relationships in the painting, as you go along, you don't really know what you're relating to. So like this highlight in relation to, you know, the, the light on the turnip, uh, that you want to establish to know how light to make this or how light to make the highlight in relation to each other. So if you don't establish that early on and you just keep doing the painting, you're not really working against a resistance that's going to be at the end of the painting. So that while you don't have everything, as you go along, which in some sense would be very difficult. To, to, because again, you would think you'd be falling into the same trap of finishing something without seeing it in relation to its, you know, to its neighbor or to some, some other aspect of the painting. So the, um, that, that would be bad to just totally finish something. But you have to, as you go along, have enough of the finished painting to tell you about the relationships you're establishing. You know, it's like making little memos, like this highlight, this highlight in relation to that, or to that, or to the light. Mm -hmm. uh, turn up here uh, enough, this stage of the painting, you may change, you know, or embroider, some of the relationships as you go along, but at least you're trying to work against what you hope the finished painting will have. So um, each thing that you put down should help you get to the next thing. Like this light, the shadow looked one way without the light on it. Uh, with, with the light on it, 
it gets into a different feeling of relationship so that as I said, you, you can say the dark should be this value, but be against the light. Uh, you're really not sure, you're not making it really a, a statement that has any validity. So everything that in the painting is in relationship to everything else in the painting. And, and so, so that's why I feel as you go along, you have to finish enough, leave, uh, don't leave certain objects, you know, in a series or by themselves until you can establish or finish it, have some kind of a highlight in other words to tell you to be able to to be able to establish a relationship uh, of what the finished painting is going to going to have. Is that, is that clear? So putting this changes the look of that back there. So each thing, every time you make an advance in the painting, you have to check all the relationships in the painting to that point. So it, it's almost like doing a jigsaw puzzle that until you put the final piece in, everything's in a state of flux, which is in a sense one of the difficulties. If, you, if you're seeing painting that way as a series of relationships and each delicate color change, each color change, value change has an effect on the entire painting in some fashion. So until it's finished, it's, everything is in that sense very loose. Then when it's you know, finish every the last piece interlocks interlocks everything. So I, I a little bit of a lot of things and then fine tuning it the subtlety. So you start, I mean this because the demonstration is a little more finished and faster than I would normally work, you understand, but well, no, I got to uh, large. I mean, I actually just completed two, two of the largest still lights I painted. And one was 32 by 28, the other was uh, 32 by 26, sort of a, a matching pair. Mm -hmm. those, Not particularly large, large, really. Just, I just feel like I think that I've done bigger ports. The largest being a portrait, I did a double wedding portrait which was six feet by four and a half feet. Uh, so, uh, John, John Mellencamp and uh, his, his bride was a wedding picture of Elaine. So uh, that, that, that's the largest canvas I've painted today. I mean, he's at his wedding and and at the reception, John came over and said, you know, I'd like you to do a painting of the wedding. And he said, make it big. <laughs> his instruction. And he didn't give me any signs, just make it big. So <laughs> difficult to figure out what he meant by big. And I got back to the studio and took some stretcher bars. I started, I think, around 30, 36, and then I just 
sorry, well, that's too long to put in the whole wedding, too small, rather, to put in the whole wedding. So I went up to 36.48, and I just kept uh, loosely putting stretches together, trying to figure out, you know, what big was. Finally, I got to six feet high, and the canvas that I made was roughly, uh, my canvas is 52, 54 inches wide, so that gave me a, a six feet by four and a half feet uh, canvas. And that, it looked like a good proportion to go larger than six feet. Seemed, uh, it would be too, get too tall and skinny. So I, I wound up with a double portrait, six feet by four and a half feet. It took me three months, a little over three months, to, to do the whole painting. Part, partially from photographs, mostly from life. Mm. From life in the sense that uh, I posed for, I saw that with, uh, I called up the photographer who shot the wedding. He sent me all the clips, and then I picked a couple of headshots and asked him to develop them. And I, I did the, the portrait of Elaine and John, I did uh, you know, from, from those pictures. And then I, but I, then I used myself for John's body, you know, put on a white shirt and a dark jacket. And so that was, you know, the rest of the body, the hands were basically me from life. Uh, the dinner table, not the dinner table, but the table with all the food and vegetables and uh, all that stuff, I set up with flowers and bottles and you know, everything, stuffed pig, made it, made a stuffed pig, <laughs> fake stuffed pig. And so that was all done from life, the flowers, the, some of the background, the trees, because an actual wedding was done from, you know, made up more or less. I mean, I had, uh, I tried to stay with the look of his play so, so it was a combination, of, uh, but a lot of it, you know, uh, for Elaine, I, I, uh, got a, I hired a couple of models to uh, pose for Elaine. So the combination of life, life and, and photography, I try to do as much with life as possible. <clears throat> it was quite a project maneuvering a canvas that big in the studio. It was quite, quite a feat. You know, a lot of times I like to work upside down on a painting because you can see the abstraction of the painting. You can see, you know, how it's working better when it's upside down rather than when it's right side up. When it's, yeah, I, I paint on it upside down. Yes, a lot of my paintings, uh, portraits, or still life, if I, if I just feel the need to get a, a more abstract, or make sure that it, I, or sometimes if I'm just having problems with a painting, I'll work on it upside down. And uh, I know it sounds strange, but it's great exercise and it's it's fun. It's it's a, I, I, it's a challenge. Uh, it's good. When I was a student in Parsons, uh, when I was in Parsons, we one of my teachers. Uh, in draw, life drawing class, 
I, I just love this thing. He would, we were sitting, we'd sit in a semicircle around the model and the teacher would say, draw the model as if you were three quarters around the other side. So you would have, you know, you'd look at the model in your position and then pick a spot three quarters around the other side and have to draw it as though you were in that spot. So you really, it was kind of, it was a mind bending kind of exercise, which, and then you could, you know, after the pose was over or just before the model would take a break, you could walk over and see how you did. So I just love stuff like that and, and you know after a while you don't think you know it's such a big deal and so working upside down is the same thing is that you could get much more abstract and see big shapes and how the color is working without the image interfering with, uh, with you so yeah portraits anything upside down it's just i tell you it's just the challenge the fun of could i do it you know could you do it one of the hardest things to do uh, was uh, some of, when they would pose the model uh, over the model stand with the head all the way back so that you're looking at a head upside down now that you know you're so used to seeing people upright you know when they, their head is tilted at center and center but to see to try to draw a head upside down that that is in a sense the most challenging exercise because you just want to turn your head you know you want to look upside down and as a, you're so familiar with somebody right side up. That, that was one of the most difficult uh, challenges uh, in, you know, in, in that kind of a mind-bending mind -bending kind of a uh, situation. More than drawing the model three quarters around the other side was trying to draw someone upside down. Never ever quite got that to a point where I felt comfortable that I was doing good, you know, or getting the features uh, and stuff in in the right in the right place. But uh, mm. it's all fun. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, since you know the first demonstration I did, I we did a I still like going across the canvas, you know, left to right. I thought I'd set up something that had more of a movement of front to back, uh, just just to give you that kind of a, an idea. The um, so in any case, what I try to do is set up something in a sense that starts here with this bunch of grapes, and then up to the the turn, and then the pause back here with the flowers to have that kind of a semicircle of semicircle movement. And starting out you know, just with drawing the idea of the painting so that instead of really drawing anything specifically in terms of the object, but really drawing the idea of the painting. So since everything, you want everything to lead to the back, the idea is to keep everything in the foreground here relatively dark so they're trying to sell this video here but, uh, 
So the light works further back in the painting. But this part's kind of a good review yeah, just to watch two it. Two things to consider in learning how to paint. And one is how do, how do you get to paint the object that you're painting to look at, the, how to get the objects you're painting to look like the objects that are in front of you, which is, I think, what most people start out thinking when they think about learning to paint. And the other is learning to paint by getting a sense of the object. Uh, getting a sense of the paint quality. No, no, I don't. Only when I'm trying to do watercolor, which I do every so often. <laughs> Proved to myself, I still can't do watercolor. <laughs> it's very hard for me to do watercolor. I don't think, I don't think like a watercolor is. So that even when I'm doing watercolor, I'm still trying to get the paint to be thicker, which of course is not. Okay, so yeah, he's gonna ramble on. Um, anyway, that was kind of a uh, review of. Uh, just going back through the painting. But what, uh, you know, we lost a couple of you. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Oops. He, he rambles, I know. It's, it's not, he's not always easy to watch. But, you know, one of the things uh, that I wanted you to get out of this, again, you know, relating back to the drawing class, was the fact that, you know, as he's, as he's working with that medium, He's not really outlining, you know, he's really just taking in and kind of figuring out really the foundation, the composition, you know, where things are going to be, how big they are, you know, what the relationships are. And that's, you know, that's more important than, um, you know, all the details. And um, again, you know, if you, if you kind of approach your drawings and your painting that way, uh, really thinking bigger picture, you know, the composition, things like that, before you get into trying to do details, your drawings and your paintings will improve. <laughs> I promise you. Okay? Yeah. So uh, anyway, anybody got any questions before we go away? No, uh, but I wanted to read what I wrote down. Painting is like, according to this painter, which I thought was really cool, Painting is like reading a novel, stringing beads, or putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, again, uh, this is a good source, uh, the Streamline Publishing uh, folks. You know, mm -hmm. they, have, they have a lot of stuff out there. And, again, you watch 20 different artists, and they're all going to have a whole totally different approach to it. Okay. And so you, you can really learn you know, a lot from any one of them. Okay. Uh, I, I keep going back to the thing, you know, it's, it's like, no matter what you want to do in art, you know, there's a thousand different ways you can approach it. And there's no real wrong way. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, every, everybody's going to develop their own process. But you know, if you stick to those few fundamental things, which is really kind of, again, that idea of working from the big thing down to the little thing, uh, you'll, you'll be more successful. That's my feeling about it, okay? Anyhow, uh, so much for that. We will be back here at two o'clock and we're gonna look at some of your drawings you sent in and, um, you know, and that'll, that'll be a wrap. So if, if you want to, if you want to have a glass of wine, you want to, you know, fix yourself a martini or whatever, for the <laughs> final, uh, that's okay. All right. 
I'll, I'll sit here and drink my coffee. <laughs> so, anyway, have a good lunch, and uh, we'll see you too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, Joe. Thank you. <laughs>